a wild and crazy new book starring the author of the number one bestseller, Cruel Shoes, is The Genius, Strikeout, The Southpaw, Strikeout, The Surgeon, Strikeout, The Jerk, The Jerk, screenplay by Steve Martin, Carl Gottlieb, Michael Elias. Story by Steve Martin and Carl Gottlieb. Introduction and text adaptation by Carl Gottlieb. Designed by Tom Noskowski. Narrated with commentary by Amy Mullen. Introduction. I was trekking in the Himalayas of Nepal in 1973 in the company of trader-adventurer Milan Melvin and an American named Addison Smith who lived in Asia for seven years. On the night of my birthday there was a full moon. I lay in my sleeping bag in a remote unnamed village near the headwaters of the Buri Gandaki, a river to the west of Kathmandu. Four years later, almost to the day, Steve Martin and I completed the first draft of the screenplay of The Jerk. The two events were unrelated, and the movie includes nothing of my Himalayan experience. Middle Ground Movies are a linear form of entertainment. They unfold along the iron line of time in a series of sequential images. If that's too technical, consider this. Unroll a movie, and you've got a strip of celluloid one and a half inches wide, and more than a mile and a half long. One and a half inches by 105,000 feet is linear, any way you look at it. Therefore, in a happy decision to let the book parallel the movie, we've adopted the same linear sequential order. The pictures in the front of the book are of the beginning of the movie, the pictures at the back of the book are of the end of the movie, and the pages in between are the photos of the middle of the movie. What could be simpler? The text and captions were written to accommodate the pictorial elements, and out of a perverse sense of fun, certain liberties have been taken. Some captions and text do not describe anything in the movie, Although they are absolutely faithful to the pictures they accompany, others are actual dialogue from the screenplay. In this book, Steve dances. A mad sniper shoots at him. A biker carnival girl seduces him. He meets his true love. He gets rich. He gets silly. These are pictures anyone can understand, perhaps even without seeing the movie. But the jerk book aims at more complex texture, more erotic levels of interpretation, so it offers a variety of photo explanations. Foreground. The jerk takes place in a time resembling the present, in a place that resembles America in the third quarter of the 20th century. Steve Martin plays Navin Johnson, a young man who one night realizes that his destiny lies somewhere outside the Mississippi Delta sharecropper's farm on which he has been raised. Navin goes out into the world to discover his roots, and along the way he discovers the joys of honest labor, the hazards of life in the city, the love of two very different women, and the experience of sudden, enormous wealth. Eventually, Navin finds himself on the streets, a derelict. That bum is the one who tells us his story, from start to finish. That bum is the jerk, and this is the book of pictures of the movie. We hope you enjoy it. Carl Gottlieb, Hollywood, California, 1979. The Jerk Navin Johnson's family celebrates his birthday at home with a sing-along. Navin, standing on the porch, nods happily, out of sync as usual. And there's a picture 
of a large multi-generational family of African Americans. They look like country folk with uh, woven wheat hats or hay hats or straw hats all sitting on a porch, clapping, playing a harmonica and a guitar and shelling peas, clapping, and Navin Johnson is wearing overalls, and he's obviously not clapping when everyone else is clapping. He looks like a big, fat fucking dork. Here, Navin conducts using a kitchen utensil as a baton. And now Navin's adoptive mom is just laughing her ass off at him because he looks like a dork. He's doing exactly what it says, using a kitchen utensil as a baton. His brother, the young man in the background, applauds Navin's ne newly acquired rhythm as his sister makes a hasty retreat. And here Navin looks really creepy, like he's... Something out of a grim fairy tale about to eat a little girl. Navin is hugged by his mother in joyous celebration of his departure from the old homestead. Why is the family so happy to see him go? Maybe the vintage aviator's helmet has something to do with it. So he's giving his mom a big old hug and a lot of his family is surrounding him and his older brother and his younger brothers and sisters. And then there's this huge picture of Navin looking very pensive and sad with his aviator helmet and goggles. Oh, and even the caption even says, This is a sensitive, pensive study of our hero. That's obvious from the photograph. What isn't evident is the salami sandwich under his hat, which accounts for the high-domed bulge to Navin's normally shaped head. His expression is perplexed as he tries to remember if there was a lot of mayonnaise on the sandwich, and if so, what, it, what will it do to his hair? I had no idea there was a salami sandwich under his helmet. Navin arrives in a service station, gains employment, and tries to qualify as a modified Sportsman Formula Junior, a type of race car. The above photo shows his arrival. The upper right shows his unsuccessful attempt at converting himself into a vehicle. His turning radius was impaired by his inability to steer with his feet. The bottom photo, right, shows Navin as the handsome, romantic leading man he really is. Just look at that face. So in that middle photo they're describing, Navin has a tire on each shoulder. I don't believe that's actually in the movie. Maybe it's part of a montage. Uh, oh, and he's got a tire on each hand, too. So he's got four tires connected to his body, which I guess anyone would assume means a human being is trying to become a car. Patriotism, duty, honor, responsibility. Navin has his first job and is proud to be a stalwart pump jockey the backbone of the retail gas delivery system. So here's a picture of Navin in his spick and span white uniform with a little bow tie and a hat. Has Navin on it. Easy serve patch. He's got a little Navin patch. And I still remember the days when a full service station would check your oil and your windshield fluid and the air in your tires and all that shit, in addition to pumping your freaking gas. I miss those days. In Oregon, it's illegal for you to pump your own gas, but you still have to go into the service station to pay for it. It's really fucking creepy. Okay, so then on the next page. Note to those readers under 25, or I'll amend that. Note to those readers under 40 or 35, since this book's kind of fucking old. There was a time in American history when gas station attendants wore uniforms with ties, cleaned windshields, checked tires, oil, and batteries, gave away free dishes and road maps, and sold gas for 29.9 cents a gallon. That was during the same period when mail was delivered twice a day, New York City worked, and Hollywood made 300 new films a year. Can you guess the year? A. 1940. 
1887, B, 1906, C, 1929, and D, 1950. Then you turn the book upside down, if you can't read upside down, and it says, that's right, 1950. If you marked D, give yourself a passing grade. Well, that's a quiz for fucking idiots, because pff, it's just a quiz for fucking idiots. I don't even think they had windshields in 1929. <sighs> Motherfucker. Okay, next page. Dear Mom, I got this great job in a gas station. I don't want to say just how much I'm getting, but let's just say it's a lot. I'm enclosing two dollars. And there's a picture of Navin all bug-eyed, looking surprised. On the next page, It's a lot of fun working, and Mr. Hartunian is really nice. He is teaching me how to be impatient. Well, I've got to go now. What do you think I do? Write letters all day? Your loving son, Navin. And there's a picture of Harry Hartunian. And the patch on his shirt, Hartunian, is spelled differently than how Navin spells it in the letter to his mother. Hey, I didn't even know Navin could write anything, never mind a long word like impatient. Wow, I guess he's not as dumb as we all thought. Okay, some hoods and low riders are out cruising and stop at Hartunian's gas station. They are about to make trouble for Navin. So here we've got the guys in the low rider who are all purse dealers, and somehow that means they're massive gangbanger, gangbangers who can afford this massive car. But what was funny about the movie is that there's this whole list at the gas station of all of these credit card numbers. Gotta love the 70s. They were just a different time. Okay, next page. Here it gets tricky. In order to more fully understand this picture... Turn the book slowly clockwise, around to the right, until the figure of the man seems to be standing upright. So I'm turning the picture around, listeners. <gasps> and now there's text that goes in that direction. Study the photo carefully, and you will see that it is a picture of Navin on his back under a car, just underneath the bumper and rear license plate. Oh my God, I see it. What an optical illusion. Now turn the book counterclockwise around to the left until it is once again in the normal reading position. So now I turn it back, and now the text. Oh, you are now lined up to continue reading normally. Turn page. Now this book is full of surprises. A great moment in science. Navin Johnson Simple garage mechanic works on, quote, optograb, unquote, a device that is destined to make his fortune and to change his life. Simply described, the optograb diverts primary pressure from the nose piece and hinges of conventional eyeglasses and directs support to the sturdy bridge of the nose via a welded wire addition that fastens simply to any existing twin-lens pair of glasses or spectacles. Clearly, this is an idea whose time has come and is not a casual invention or dramatic device created simply to enrich our hero. The optograb was, and is, the result of painstaking research, and its use does not necessarily lead to disfiguring crossed eyes. Ooh, spoiler alert. However, full testing of the optograb is still in progress, and commercial models may become available for street use without prescription. Watch for them at your local optician, drugstore, or novelty shop. They, may, they also may be on sale in your neighborhood theater. Optograb. An idea you can see. And then on the right-hand side, there's a picture of Navin, hard at work with a soldering iron and a pair of eyeglasses. On the next page, Stanley Fox, promoter, is wearing the optograb, left, while Navin Johnson, below, doubles over in reaction to the first appearance of his invention. So Stanley Fox on the left is wearing a a uh, checked coat, a uh, checked sports coat, and a clashing 
bow tie and he looks like a big old dork with his optograb glasses and he's got a weird expression on his face. He's like, duh. And then the picture of Navin Johnson doubling over, he actually looks like he's taking a dump without the use of a toilet under his butt. Next page. The madman is a sniper determined to give Navin a hard time. Here he fastens a silencer to the barrel of what appears to be an M16. Weapon buffs. Is this possible? We know it's illegal. So then there's a picture of the bad man putting a silencer on the barrel of an M16. He looks, he doesn't look mad. He just, not mad in a crazy sense. He just looks kind of disgruntled. You know, like most of us do in traffic or something. Okay, and then on the next page, there's a picture of the guy shooting in tall grass. You see the explosion coming out of the gun or the firing or whatever. There's a big question mark on the page opposite it. Can you guess what this madman is shooting at? Some possible suggestions. And there's a little checklist. A gasoline station. A tall rabbit. A short giraffe. And then there are two more spots with the letter A and a blank space and check boxes. So you can fill in. Navin Johnson joins C.F. Furlinger's traveling sideshow and carnival. Here he is dressed for work. So here he's wearing, Navin Johnson is wearing a top hat, crazy sunglasses, this crazy collar, crazy boutonniere, and a crazy cape. He looks kind of crazy, kind of like a carny. Navin is guessing age, weight, and occupation on the midway. His new friend is Patty Bernstein, who, has, who is an aggressive carnival daredevil. So there's Navin wearing his checked pants and his coat with tie, uh, um, flaps. What, are, what is that called? Um, tails. Coat with tails. Top hat. Crazy lapel action going on on his shirt. And Patty Bernstein, Bernstein, is uh, on a chopper. It has flames on the gas tank. She's wearing thigh-high boots. Looks like fishnets. Some sort of crazy chain-link bustier and crazy hair and a crazy um, cape. She's crazy. She's the crazy biker chick at the carnival. Patty Bernstein's makeup and costume were, spe were specially designed, not just thrown together, for her carnival act, and to wear to the market or walk the dog. So here's a picture of Patty, beautiful, lovely Patty, with her, you can see her cape now, it looks kind of like bat wings, it has like, um, you know, the, the, the things, the bars that hold it up, I forget what they're called. And you can see she's got like a leopard spotted choker holding up chains that are holding up her bustier, but it's her makeup. Her makeup is like this faux kiss, like crazy, crazy eye makeup. And her hair is supposed to be punk, but it's not punk. It's sort of like a 70s soccer mom. So that's Patty. Here, Navin applauds Patty for her real realistic impression of Superman. All she's doing is standing on her feet, raising her hands high in the air. You could see her armpits. I guess she looks like Superman, and he's applauding. He looks like a dork. Again. Carnival life is tough. Navin, above, talks Patty into wearing a helmet for her famous... Riding over a VW backwards stunt. She agrees and is shown, right, ascending the hoop end of the VW in preparation for her leap backwards. Carnival life is boring. Patty, below, in the midst of a seemingly difficult stunt, is totally ignored by the few passers-by on the midway, only one of whom actually turns his head to watch while walking in the opposite direction to get a corn dog from the concession stand. Not shown. A. I would love a corn dog right about now. 
and to be on a carnival midway. Uh, these pictures are really actually quite boring. Nothing to comment about. Next page. Right. Navin Johnson at his new job. His hat says Engineer Fred. So Navin's riding like a little, one of those tiny little trains that kids ride in. And he's on the engine, which is like tiny. It's like smaller than a pony, but bigger than a big wheel. He looks pretty silly, but all the kids behind, well, the look on one girl's face behind him, she looks like appalled and she's like, what the hell am I doing on here? Okay. Opposite page below. Patty Bernstein seems to be in a pensive mood. Hey, they like that word, pensive. Just out of sight of the camera, specially defanged wild dogs are attacking her feet with comic results. I don't think that happens in the movie. I think that's this guy's idea of a joke, which is stupid. Next page. Navin meets his true love, Marie, who is taking care of little Billy for a friend. So here we have Navin Johnson laughing, holding his um, engineer Fred hat, wearing engineer coveralls, which I covet greatly. Those are so cool. And we've got the first look at gorgeous Marie wearing a hat, sun hat with flowers in it and looking, you know, very clean and very square and straight compared to Patty, who looks like a fucking freak out of, you know, a soccer mom's idea of what a punk would look like on Halloween. And here's Billy, who's a little prick. And they actually don't have the shirt where he's wearing a cuss word on it in the book. I wonder if they... The 70s version of Photoshop. Got rid of that. Life in a carnival is still boring. Okay, now Patty's looking a little bit better. She's wearing uh, garters and thigh highs and cowboy boots. And she's wearing like a mesh top over a tiny bra. And a, she's wearing a, a leather jacket with studs. So here she's finally starting to clue into what a tough gal really looks like. Despite the fact that a man is caught with a roundhouse right to the stomach, nobody in the background seems to care. There is lots to see in a carnival, and a fight between Patty and Naven has no attraction for these jaded fun seekers. Life in a Carnival is Rough, Part 2. Below, Patty gives Naven a rough time based on her assumption that he has been seeing another woman. Not shown, but you might have guessed. It's Marie. So yeah, on one side, she's, one picture, she's punching him in the gut. Not even in the gut. It's more like under his right armpit. It wouldn't even hit a rib, I think. And then she's got him on the ground, and she's, uh, she has a switchblade not even close to his face, but he looks all freaked out anyway. And then there's this big arrow, and in the arrow it says, To Marie! And we turn the page. Two women in Navin Johnson's life. Patty, above, whom we've already described at some length, gets the smaller picture. And Marie, Navin's true love, right, gets the photo coverage and billing to which she's entitled. And Marie is wearing the sort of dress that you would see on the cover of those stupid Amish romances, which are all the fucking rage now. I have no idea where the fuck that came from or what kind of psychotics actually read or write that shit. But yeah, she's wearing like this high collared dress with like a lace collar and it's all like buttoned up and she looks like Little House on the fucking Prairie, except a little too fucking old to play that game. Next page. Okay, she's still wearing that stupid dress. Left to right, Marie Camp Kimball, a sprig of brush, and Navin Johnson, who is presenting the latter to the former as a love offering. Navin has fallen for Marie. Their deepening involvement is further illustrated on the following pages. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, some backstory. Navin is presenting a bunch of twigs to Marie. And she's like, oh, twigs, nice, or like stems. And the thing is, Navin had bought flowers for Marie. They were daisies. Patty caught him with the daisies, so she ripped off all the tops. So all he has left are the stems. He tries to pass them off as rose stems, but what a fucking idiot. Okay, I almost lost my page there. Okay, so now next page. Navin and Marie have just concluded an intimate dinner. 
some tasty pizza in a cup. So we see Naven and Marie sitting. There's no caption. They've got the stupid flower stems in a mug between them, and their pizza in a cup on either side on a fucking wooden crate, and they're both sitting on a bunch of crap, like folded up tents in his trailer. The page, the picture below that, there's a mouth bubble. Naven says, you have beautiful skin, and he's totally squashing her face with a hand. And then the opposite page, the voice bubble says, well, here's a little something to remember me by, and they kiss. Aww. Okay, next page, their first screen kiss. Naven and Marie look deep into each other's eyes, above, and then, right, bring their lips together for the first screen kiss. Well, perhaps not actually together, but close. So yeah, you could see he's just sort of mushing her face. He's like kissing her nostril. He's about to poke her in the eye with his nose. And yeah, it looks totally romantic. Next page. Okay, now they're singing. They've got la coming out of their mouths. Marie's wearing a sailor hat. At least she's not wearing fucking Holly Hobby clothing anymore. Simultaneous self-expression. Naven and Marie sing the sixth tone of the scale together in a tender moment. Next page. Honey. There's a question I'd like to pop, but I've been afraid that you might say no. But this seems like the right time and place. So here goes. Marie, will you marry me? But alas, Marie sends him a dear Naven letter, which he reads in the tub. So Naven's in the bathtub, proposing to Marie, who's in the next room, breaking up with him. Next page. After reading Marie's wet letter, Naven races out to her. So he's running out of the house, buck naked. He has the dog, who we haven't even met yet, who's a really big part of the movie. The dog, shithead, holding him in front of his junk so he doesn't get arrested for indecent exposure. So he's holding the dog in front of his junk. And then on the next page, he's still holding the dog in front of his junk. Marie, 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 why did you leave me? I couldn't read the letter. It was too blurry. Next page. Okay, so now he's writing a letter to his mom, I guess. Did I miss a page? There's no, like, dear mom. Okay, next page. Uh, there's a picture of Naven dragging his dog on a leash, and he's carrying a suitcase. You'd like her, Ma. Her name is Marie Kimball. She's worth every pain I'll have to go through. And so, Mom, with my faithful dog leading the way, I'm out to become the man she desires. I'm only going to take jobs that lead somewhere big. Your loving son, Naven. Okay, next page. There's a picture of... Um, the dork, the first, one of the dorky guys with the, a lady wearing an optograb and he's pointing to this big picture and Naven's with him smiling. And in the one below that, the guy who isn't even wearing glasses, he's presenting something to Naven. Let's find out what it is on the next page. So on the top of this page, there's a beehive, an Ill a beautiful, classy illustration of a beehive that says nothing without labor. Money is the traditional reward for ingenuity and originality in the marketplace, according to the tenets of free market capitalism. Find a need, create a desire, and people will find their way to your door, dollars in their fists, begging for a chance to buy whatever it is you've got they think they need. Navin Johnson and Stanley Fox are part of this great tradition. Optograb is an idea whose time has come. The envelope in Stan Fox's hand in the bottom photograph at right is Naven's, quote, cut, unquote, his share, the money he is owed, the dollars he has earned. From now on, his life is going to be different. Change is the unforeseen, inevitable camp follower to the glittering armies of the nouveau riches. Capitalism, like virtue, 
has its own rewards. Okay, turn the page. So there's a picture of Navin wearing crazy butterfly sunglasses with the optograb on it, holding the check, smiling like, holy shit. Just smiling like he had the, just took the best dump of his life. On the opposite page, a whole bunch of dollar signs in different fonts. The face of a man whose life has changed. Notice how many teeth are showing. This is no ordinary smile. This is a real grin. And check the glasses. No ordinary spectacles with an optograb tacked on. These are custom butterfly-tinted shades. And when you look through them, the world is colored like money. Green, black, white, and lots of little images of Benjamin Franklin and Ulysses S. Grant floating in ovals just under where it says, Federal Reserve Note. You look at the world that way, and your life will be different. Next page. Harry Hartunian and his wife, Leonore, uh, Lenore. Harry Hartunian and his wife Lenore get the news from Navin via postcard. From now on, it's spend, spend, spend. So Lenore, the trophy wife, is wearing these uh, like really outsized rhinestone rimmed shades, which are pretty fucking fat, actually. They're pretty cool. With an optograb, and she's got her 70s feathered hair and some weird halter that shows her cleavage. And then next to her is Harry Hartunian, also wearing the optograb, also with his name spelled differently on the tag than they spell it in the text. And the postcard is uh, something from Chinatown. Los Angeles, Chinatown. That's the postcard they get, where they read the news. They're both reading the postcard. Next page. Navin and his ever-faithful dog, resplendent in their new attire, pause before leaving Navin's shabby apartment to seek life's splendors. And Marie. So Navin's wearing this weird patchwork suit with duck boots and a scarf. And his dog has a hat and sunglasses. I guess that's their idea of rich people. I don't know. Below, Navin's dog, wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap, smokes a pipe as he waits for Navin in their new pink Mustang. I'm sorry, I should read first and then comment, because I'm just repeating the obvious here. Young inventor strikes it rich. So here's a little clip from a newspaper article. Said yesterday that earnings had risen 20 erd to 85.9 million or uh, to 38.1 million or mm, comparable period Ochester based com sales in the period a record 2 billion la last year benefited from a X rate and increased said Walter A. Fall chief executive and president added however that results in the fort acted to be adversely unfavorable economy the United States ends of the year will of recent substantial materials, costs, and that's all we can read from that article. Navin finds one of life's splendors. Now for Marie. So now he's wearing this big old, like, country squire hat, cross, Robin Hood, big old feather, and a really, it should be, it's supposed to be nice art, but from here it looks like just a black velvet painting, which is not necessarily not nice art. I think it's nice art, but... Some people do not think it's nice art. Next page. Navin finds Marie working in a department store in the men's cosmetic section. Unable to see his good looks under a mask of noxious clay, Marie wonders about her old friend from the carnival. So you see Marie in the background wearing a flower in her hair, a lab coat, and then someone's in the foreground with this clay mask on his face and a shower cap and a, barb a striped barber apron over him. Next page. Marie, about to peel off the mask oderm, is in for a surprise. Irving has been replaced by, that's right, Navin. Okay, so now they're about to hug even though he still has the shit on his face. Next page. It's love at last for, next page, 
America's sweetheart. So then there's a picture of Marie wearing her white lab coat, flower in her hair, looking really pretty, standing in front of like a, a dummy head. Best wishes, Marie Kimball. And then on the other side, there's the picture of Naven with the stupid hat. Your message here, sincerely, Naven Johnson. And those are both like handwritten, like they're autographing their own pictures. Next page. Okay, Marie and Naven are... Oh, wait, I'll just read it. Dear Mom, here's this month's check. $20,000. Things are beginning to look up. But the big news is Marie and I were married. We couldn't wait. We decided to get married that night. Luckily, we found a certified priest at the, quote, Hollywood View Apartments, unquote, who could marry us. Your loving son, Naven. So then I guess this is supposed to be what they think is an African witch doctor voodoo guy marrying them. Yeah. There's a skull in the background and some groovy folks in attendance. And Marie's wearing white and Naven's wearing a suit. Next page. Marie's garage apartment is home for the newlyweds. At right, Marie and Naven are playing house in the kitchen, tiptoeing so as not to awaken Hobart and Hester, the English butler and maid, who are asleep on a single bed in the living room. So Marie is wearing like some very skimpy lingerie with an apron over it and uh, some high heels. And Naven's wearing what looks like a 70s leader suit. Next page. Sir, it would seem that with this kind of income, you would buy a bigger home with servants' quarters. So there's Hobart. They're still dressed the same way. Hobart's wearing like a, I don't know, pajamas, handing Naven an envelope. Next page. Naven and Marie consult a real estate agent who shows them a house complete with paintings. This art has Naven crushing his box of Cracker Jacks. I can't even see the art. You just see a picture of Naven wearing a suit a jacket with tennis rackets on it, like cross tennis rackets, and he's holding a box of Cracker Jacks, like, just like it says. Next page. And now here's a picture of him from the front, also holding the Cracker Jacks. A note on Cracker Jacks. The box Steve is holding, I thought his name was Naven. Why are we calling him Steve? The box Steve is holding in both photos, above, right, is good old Cracker Jacks, the kind you get at the zoo or the ball game. They have little prizes inside, usually a tiny paper book, a plastic toy, or a novelty. There's one important thing to know about Cracker Jacks. The fresh boxes rattle when you shake them. The stale ones don't. The caramel coating, they spell it C-A-R-E-C-A-R-M-E-L. Uh, That's not how you spell caramel. The caramel coating has stuck all the little Cracker Jacks together. They're still good to eat, but they're not individual anymore. And does anyone know if there's still as many peanuts in the boxes as there used to be? Oh my god, how did this person ever write anything? Rich! Naven stands smiling in the driveway of his new home, which the staff, right, seems to think is more appropriate to their station. Okay, so you see Naven dressed up with like... Um, clashing plaids and argyles and saddle shoes, kind of like a, a English golfer who's colorblind. And then on the right, you've got the butler all decked out in the butler clothes in front of a backdrop of dollar signs with exclamation points. Next page. Naven in bed. Is this the life or is this the life? Now here we've got a picture of a bedroom that I would like. It's like a circular bed. It's all decked out in lip, uh, zebra print and chiffon. And it just looks so groovy, baby. Next page. Dear Mom, Marie and I are getting along swell. I've got a lot to learn. What with signing checks, learning about credits and debentures, certificates of deposit, you have to be careful. Enclosed is this week's check. Your loving son, Naven. 
The new Navin displays a depth of attitude and a rugged handsomeness. So does Marie. So Navin now, there are two pictures of him looking kind of like a fashion plate. He's wearing like a a silk blouse and a silk dressing gown with um, flowers on the dressing gown. And Marie is wearing uh, Daisy Dukes and a baseball jersey that comes off the shoulder and no bra. And she's carrying a baseball bat and she's got a baseball glove on her hand and a satin baseball hat on her hair. Next page. Navin, already rich beyond his wildest imaginings, is approached by con men with nefarious schemes. They don't know what they're getting into, but neither does Navin. So now he's walking around with like a bunch of semi mafiosi guy, and then he, in the next page, he's taking a karate stance with a black belt, and he's not wearing a shirt. Next page. Naturally, the family manse has a fabulous private movie screening room. Do Navin and Marie show Jaws or La Cage à Faux? You bet they don't. What they screen is this grainy black and white documentary style film that is brought to Navin by Carlos Las Vegas de Cordoba. Cat juggling, Mexican style, was filmed under impossible conditions and smuggled out of the country. The first footage ever shot of this new sport is unreeled on the next few pages. When the flying pussycats are finished, they will be returned to the basket, which is being held by the juggler on the opposite page. So there is a picture of a guy with a foul look on his face. He's got dark hair and sideburns and a cigarette in his mouth. He's got a little kitten in his hand and there's a basket in his other hand. Next page. Kittens, airborne, no wires, no gimmicks, true juggling. So now you've got in the foreground the juggler guy who we see now is really Steve Martin. There is an arrow pointing up to his hands, and the arrow says kittens on it with an exclamation point, and he's got about two or three kittens in his hands. But they're not really airborne. It's more like he's holding them. And then behind him there's a group of guys. Some of them look kind of, you know, like sketchy, I guess. Um, and some of them are holding kittens and some of them are holding beer. They're, most of them are wearing hats. Next page. Above, an exciting moment as the little kitties whiz through the air in furry circles, their mews and meows drowned out by the roars of the appreciative crowd. It is reported that there is spirited wagering on the sidelines as to how many circuits a cat will complete before it's dropped, how high they'll go, and the, quote, quinella, or quinella, unquote, in which a courageous bettor can win enormous payoffs by successfully predicting the five directions five cats will run when dropped simultaneously to the floor. So above that, more pictures of the cat juggling. Here they actually are kind of flying pretty high in the air. And there's some guy with a beer cigarette box selling beer and cigarettes. Below, the juggler, his face contorted with the effort of keeping three cats in the air while bouncing a fourth and fifth off the uneven dirt floor. Note, observers point out that it is only during cat juggling that the usually agile feline will fail to land on its feet. So now you see the juggler, who's really Steve Martin, with his cigarette and his mustache and a crazy look on his face, like he just got goosed, and he's got a cat in each hand. I don't see where the third one is. It still looks like he's only holding two cats. Next page. Navin and Marie are living it up, dining out at a French restaurant. Service is slow, which explains their bored expressions and the behavior of the diner in the center background, who is eating his thumb and forefinger while waiting for his appetizer. At right, Navin is taking exception to the escargot on Marie's plate, while the waiter stands by in display. So Marie's all decked out. She's, I really like that dress, actually. It's a really nice dress, and it, you see almost all of her boobs um, and Navin also, he's decked out, but not really. He's wearing a smoking jacket, which is fancy, but 
I don't think you're supposed to leave the house in a smoking jacket. And it's the scene from the movie where she's got snails on her plate. And he flips out. Okay, next page. Above, Navin and Marie get up to kiss, but the weight of the gold chains around his neck, right, puts him into the soup. So up top, they're about to kiss. They've got their faces puckered. They've got their asses sticking out as they rise up from the table. Everyone around them is staring at them and laughing. Then you see a picture of Navin mugging for the camera, like fall, almost falling backwards, people behind him laughing. And then on the next picture, his face is in the soup with all of his stupid gold chains, which I could say would never happen to Mr. T. He would never let his face fall in the soup. Next page. And Mom, I love to write and tell you all about what Marie and I are up to. Our days are so full, and so are our nights, which are spent in our very own basement disco. So then there's a picture of Navin and Marie disco dancing looking all hot and shit next page we dance the night away mom so then there's another picture they're on their dance floor with the disco ball up top and the lights and everyone applauding them everyone wearing glasses with the optograb next page marie is this what we really want oh it's supposed to be like marie speaking is this what we really want? And here's a picture of them dancing where she's got their she's got her back to his front and her legs wrapped around him and she's perpendicular to the floor and he's sort of squatting down. And the next page, Navin. Sure. And it's a similar picture and they both look like they're really happy dancing. That's a pretty tough dance move. Good job, guys. Okay, next page. Now she's on the floor. And he's standing next to her with an umbrella in his drink. It's such fun. Marie and I are really drinking a lot. It's great. We get wobbly and real funny. You'd be so proud of us. Enclosed is your regular check. Your loving son, Navin. So now, for some reason, she's still on the floor. She's looking up at him. He put his drink down on the floor and he's reaching into his coat. Nothing extraordinary. Next page. Disaster strikes! Navin's pie in the sky hits him in the face. A class action suit against Navin and Optigrab is initiated. Leader of the lawsuit is celebrated director Mr. Carl Reiner, who explained the action at a press conference. So then there's a picture of Carl Reiner cross-eyed with a bunch of microphones in his face from different news outlets. When Optigrab came out, I thought it was the greatest thing ever, and I bought a pair and this is the result. That little handle is like a magnet. Your eyes are constantly drawn to it, and you end up cockeyed. And as a director, I am constantly using my eyes, and the optograb device has caused irreparable harm to my career. Next page. Now Navin is in deep trouble. Facing the loss of his newfound wealth, he appeals to the judge and jury and confronts his accusers. Among them, and their leader, his own director, Carl Reiner, playing Carl Reiner, the director. Marie watches, knowing all is lost and that the party's really over. So you've got a typical courtroom picture, and then underneath, Navin has his hands up like, Why? Why me? Oh. Next page. Navin loses everything. He's flat broke. So then there's a picture of him looking like a schlub with a wrinkled shirt and terry cloth bathrobe that's looking threadbare and a look on his face that, man, it's over. It's over. Okay, next page. Navin in distress. Two views. Left. Profile. Walking. Below. Full front view. Standing. So in both pictures, he's wearing shoes. He's got his pants down around his ankles. You see his boxer shorts, same threadbare terry cloth robe, same rumpled shirt. And he's carrying all of his crap, which is like a ping pong paddle, paddle ball game and a uh, lamp, a uh, chair. He's got a chair. Next page. 
So that's him, rock bottom, Navin rock bottom. Navin leaves Marie, taking with him a few belongings from their home. So now it's the same picture of Navin, like the same get up, same props, just in front of a really big ass staircase and some marble statuary. Next page. Navin, deprived of money, fame, and fortune, turns to the bottle and is shown here draining life's bitter dregs. A tasty potation of wormwood and gall, cheap muscatel and spoiled vanilla extract. It is the street person's favorite brew, the bagman's Beaujolais. So then there's a picture of Navin with a bottle in a paper bag. It just looks like a bottle of beer and a dorky look on his unshaven, dirty face. Next page. Woo-wee, Navin seems to be saying, as he savors the aftertaste of the drink described above. His street companions have no reaction. They're nursing their own drinks or napping off the effects of earlier swallows. So now you see Navin, like, yawning. He looks more like he's yawning than saying, ooh-wee. He looks like a drunk. Navin, on the edge of despair, is discovered by his family, who welcome him back with open arms. Navin is clutching a little thermos bottle in his right arm. So then there's a picture. There's a bum on the ground. Navin standing close to the bum with the thermos bottle. And then there's his dad wearing a really, really natty suit. That's a sweet, sweet suit. And Navin is reminded that there's no place like... Next page. Home! So then there's the porch. Everyone's wearing white. Everyone looks really fancy. And it looks like he's still not dancing to the beat very well. But it's hard to tell with a still photo. And so... As in all good fairy tales, our hero and heroine live happily ever after. Or do they? We'll have to wait for the sequel. The Jerk 2. Or maybe Two Jerks to find out. And now... Oh, wait. No, sorry. Now, how about a round of applause for all the people who brought you The Jerk? And then there's a picture of Navin looking very distinguished suit and tie and all that jazz, the, you know, little hanky in the pocket and thick glasses and the optograb and his hair is brushed and he's not a drunk anymore. And you turn the page and now it's got all the credits from the movie. And you turn the page again and you've got more credits from the movie. The end. Thank you for listening to The Jerk. This was your narrator and commentator, Amy Mullen. I was very disappointed when I ordered this book through the internet, and I got it, and I found out that it wasn't really a novelization. It's just a bunch of stills from the movie with some really awful commentary. They don't even pick out what I think are some of the funniest parts of the movie, or they glide over them. Like, there's no mention of the thermos song. Come on. Just a little bit at the end where he's carrying a thermos. I mean, seriously, very, very disappointed. So I did the best I could bringing it alive to you. But I would definitely recommend having this on in the background while maybe you're doing some house cleaning and then just going and watching the original because the movie is still like a work of genius. And uh, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words but in this case see the moving picture and skip the jerk novelization because it's pretty lame but thank you for listening anyway and please by all means listen to some other audiobooks for the damned